Hi, this is Matthew Crowder from Trader University. And today I want to talk about the most dangerous ETFs. If you're interested in dividend investing, ETF investing, if you want to learn strategies, trading and investing strategies that work in bull or bear markets, or if you just want to see what I'm investing in or trading, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So today I'm going to talk about two kinds of dangerous ETFs. And the first kind are leverage ETFs. These are the kind that give you 2x, 3x exposure. And I'm also going to talk about a couple different types of commodity ETFs. But before I get started with that, I want to point out a bunch of ETFs that I do like that are not dangerous at all, or that are not especially dangerous. SPY is a good one. This tracks the S&P 500. It gives you exposure to the 500 biggest companies uh, by market cap out there. SPY or its uh, Vanguard version, which I believe has slightly lower fees, VOO. These just give you 1x exposure to the S&P 500. These are often good for long-term investors who just want to sort of cost average in, buy a little bit every single month with their savings. These should do well over the long term and they're highly diversified across 500 companies. QQQ is sort of the tech version of this, a lot of tech and biotech names. DIA uh, will give you exposure to the Dow 30, the Dow Jones Industrials, which you often is the most quoted index out there. DIA is fine. And then finally, IWM, which is the Russell 2000. This is small cap exposure. So all of these are fine. Where I really have a problem, and I have a big problem with these, I actually think they should not be legal because so few people understand how they work. And the people who put them out know how they work, but they're just fairly cynically collecting fees. I have a problem with leveraged ETFs and I'm going to show you exactly exactly why. So these would be things that give you 2x, 3x exposure, two times, three times the returns of an index like the S&P 500, maybe a basket of gold miners, uh, crude oil, any, anything like this. So SSO would be one and uh, SPUU would be another one. These are just different companies versions of the same thing. They give you 2x exposure. And these do work for single day moves. And I'll, I'll show you why that why that is. If you're just going to day trade and not hold them overnight and uh, uh, hold them just intraday, these can be these can be okay. I, I personally prefer futures, which I'll show you. I'll show you why. Now, there's been a lot of leverage ETFs clo uh, closing in the last couple months due to the market volatility. Just a ton of them. I'll link to this uh, in the description notes below. But this should give you an idea of how dangerous they are. So let's talk about why leverage ETFs have an inherent problem and why you can't really hold them for more than a single day. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to imagine an underlying index that is uh, currently trading at 100. And we're going to see how the index moves over time. And then I'm also going to show you how a 2x version, a leveraged ETF version of this would move. So let's just watch the uh, underlying index. It moves from 100 to 110 over a 24 hour period. We can talk about market close to market close, moves up 10%. Now, if you buy the ETF, the 2x ETF, it will give you two times the exposure to this 10% move. So instead of going up 10%, in other words, making $10 on $100, you will make $20 on $100. Now, this is, this is, um, this is fine, this, this will work okay. But where you run into problems with leverage ETFs is when you hold them for more than a day or two and especially when the underlying index is volatile. So let's say that we have a multi-day holding period here. We would like, we think that this underlying index is gonna go up over time. So we hold it for a couple more days. Now, if we just held it for one day, we doubled the performance of the underlying index. We made 20% instead of 10%, that's great. But let's say the next day it goes back to 100. So we're back to where we started. Uh, but the, the compounding works a little bit differently because when you go from 110 down to 100, you only are down 9%. Whereas if you go from 100 to 110, you're up 10%. This is just basically how the math works. But uh, the way these leverage ETFs work, if I were to go from uh, 120 and I would double this, this performance here, in other words, I would be down, uh, call it 18%, you can see that I'll actually end up below the initial starting price. 
even though the index has just gone from 100 to 110 back to 100, I've gone from 100 to 120, which was great, and now I actually have a loss, even though the underlying index has not moved. Now let's say it bounces right back up to 110. You can see that I don't get quite back up to 120 where I was before, simply because I am going up uh, 20%, but from a lower number from this 98. Now let's say we bounce right back to 100 where we started. So if we were, if we were, if we own the underline, we'd be at a break-even price. We wouldn't have made or lost any money based on the holding period. But the 2x one, where we've already lost a little, uh, almost 4%. We started at 100, we're down to 96. So the, even though the underlying index hasn't gone anywhere. Now let's see what happens if the index goes negative actually from, from our entry price. So we entered at 100, let's say it goes to 90. And we're assuming this is a bullish 2x leveraged ETF. Um, the, a similar thing will happen for the inverse ones, which is allows you to uh, short. I also don't recommend those. And again, all of this, none of this is obviously investment recommendation, not investment advice. You got to consult with a financial advisor. But just trying to educate you on how these how these move because I get a lot of questions about them. So we've had this bounce around. We can say this is this is actually very high volatility here, going from 100 to 110. These are 10% moves, and uh, this is quite a big drawdown actually, going from 110 to 90. That's quite quite painful. But what happens if you're in the 2x? Well, if you're in the 1x, you entered at 100. You're just down 10%. You went from 100 to 90. But on the 2x, you've gone from 100 to 77. So the underlying index is down 10%. You would expect the 2x to be down 20%. But because of the way that the, way the compounding works, it's actually down more like uh, 23%. Again, let's assume that the underlying bounces back up to 100. So again, we're sort of at break even, 100 to 100. Uh, the 2x ETF is at 94. We're down 6%. Now, losing 6% of your money can be quite painful, especially when the underlying hasn't really gone anywhere. Let's say it bounces back down to 90 one more time. We hit a new low on the leverage ETF. We're down to 75. And then let's say it goes up to 110. So it's moved from 100. The underlying has moved from 100 to 110. We'd be up 10% if we own the underlying. But on the leverage ETF, bouncing back up we are only up to uh, 108, 91. So even though we were in a leverage ETF, because of this volatility and because it did not take a straight path, the 1x leverage, the underlying is up 10%, we're only up eight, 9%, even though we took a leverage position. And you can see what can happen if, the, if it keeps bouncing back and forth, even if the underlying st stays around 100, if it bounces up and bounces down, you will have this decay of returns here. Now you could also try shorting these. That's a little more, bit more risky because there's if if they start to move in one direction, you can lose a lot of money. So these leverage ETFs, if you think uh, that the underline is going to continue to move in one direction day after day after day after day, which is a pretty hard. It's hard enough to sort of predict what's going to happen in the next day. If you think you're going to get a string of winners, these leverage ETFs will do great. But if there's going to be any volatility. And especially like we're in a bear market right now, it's April 2020 as I record this, when you have high volatility, these leverage ETFs uh, have a tendency to really decay and they can actually go to zero. And that's one reason there've been so many ETFs that have uh, closed in the last month since this, this bear market started. So this is the weird compounding that happens. And this is the problem with these underlying, uh, these underlying ETFs. Now, I prefer to trade, if I want to go long the S&P uh, 500, I will use, and I want to use some leverage, I will use the futures, either the E-mini futures or the E-mini micro, the micro E-mini futures. These will track the index exactly, and you can sort of dial up or dial down your leverage. Each point that the underlying moves is $50 for the, uh, for the E-minis. I will link to, I have another video where I talk about how to trade these. And so I will link to that as well. Now, um, yeah, this is this is the one how to short the stock market using futures. I will definitely link to that. Um, what next? Okay, so these are leveraged. This is the problem with leverage ETFs, and it would apply not just to indexes, but also to uh, baskets of 
of uh, industry stock. So for example, JNUG, JNUG, uh, these are the gold miners, the, the junior gold miners, 3X. Dust is the gold miners, the inverse of that with a bearish one. These all have the same compounding problems. And gold mining companies can be extremely volatile, even in normal bull markets. And so that makes these quite dangerous as well. Uh, again, these will make money if the gold miners move day after day in the same direction. You can go long, or, go long or go short, but you're much better off trading the underlying companies rather than uh, trading trading these. So that's the problem with leverage ETFs: the weird compounding effects. Now let me talk briefly about commodity ETFs. The one that people are always asking me about is USO, United States Oil Fund. And people think if they buy this ETF, they're somehow getting to participate in some field in the ground and they own some oil and they feel very good about this because in, in uncertain times with the virus and pandemic and the financial crisis, wouldn't it be great to have your own oil well? Unfortunately, that is not what you, what you have here. What this actually is, is this is a fund that buys the futures. It buys crude oil futures and then it gives you exposure through this fund. So USO trades like a stock, but what it's actually holding is it's holding uh, crude oil futures, WTI, West Texas Intermediate. And I'll, I'll link to all these below, but we can see here that it, um, it, it, it basically owns the NYMEX futures. And what it does is, let me just roll to scroll right down here. There's something I wanted to show you guys here. So it, it owns, let's see, here we go. USO tenor strategy. USO invests solely in front month futures contracts. This means that the fund will be particularly sensitive to changes in spot prices, but maybe price higher or lower than spot. And then it's rolled where you basically take, you, uh, you exit your current futures positions and buy futures that are a little bit further out. So that's USO. I'm gonna show you the problem it has. UCO is an even more toxic version of it. And you can see how much this thing has uh, fallen. This is the leverage, the leverage version. I think this is 2X. Yeah, this is 2X the return in, uh, in WTI. And if we just look at a, um, a chart of it, crude oil has fallen quite a bit, obviously. But this thing has gone from 20 to uh, one or two. So it's really down um, just, a, just a tremendous amount. Um, because of the leverage. Yeah, year to date, it's down 90, 91%. Now, what is the problem with these commodity e ETFs? Obviously, UCO is levered, so we end up with some of the same problems that we talked about with these leveraged ETFs. But what about USO? It just owns the futures. It seems fairly innocent, right? Uh, now, the strange thing about this is anyone can buy USO, but not anyone can trade futures. You need to be approved for a futures account. So the regulators here are really giving in to industry, industry pressure. And these things are capital destruction devices. Retail investors who trade these or invest in them almost always lose a lot of money. And usually because they don't understand what they own. You don't own an oil field here. What you own are these crude oil futures. So these are the crude oil futures that trade on the, uh, the CME, on the NYMEX, which is owned by the CME. And the way futures work and this is necessary, I'm going through this so you understand what you own if you own USO. The way futures work is you have these different months for delivery. So if you're an oil, oil producer, you'll sell forward your, your oil production and you get to lock in a sales price. If you're a consumer of crude oil, maybe you're a refinery that buys the crude oil and turns it into uh, petroleum products, you'll be buying these futures. Or if you're a speculator, you'll be trading in these. So we can see they're different delivery months, they're called, different expirations, different deliveries. May 2020, June 2020, July 2020, and they go way, they go all the way out for many, many years. But what USO does is it sits in this front month, which right now, well, it's technically right now, it's May. This closed at around $20 per barrel. But what will happen is it needs to roll before these expire or really when the open interest goes over. So you can see here the open interest in June is 478,000. 78, open interest in May is 231,000. So May is technically the front month, but uh, the real front month is June. This is where the real trading volume is and where the, especially where the open interest is. And so what USO needs to do is they need to slowly, over a four day period when the roll happens, 
they will sell their May futures and they will buy their June futures. And by doing this, and then when some more time passes, they will sell their June futures and buy July futures. So they're constantly trying to stay at the front end of the curve, which is uh, the, the near dated contracts here. Now this seems like a good strategy and sometimes it will work, but here's the problem. If we look at where June is traded, June is currently at 26. The front month May is call it at uh, 20. It's at 1987, we'll just, we'll just round up. So what happens if crude oil just stays where it is? And uh, we buy the, we roll into the June futures, we pay $26 for them, and then as they get close to expiration, what happens is it's called rolling down the curve. Basically, crude oil is in contango, this axis is time, this axis is price, as you go out further in time, the price of crude oil goes up. And so if you rolling down the curve means you buy up here and then you sell down here. Now, if you buy at 26 and sell at 20, that's just a huge, that's a huge loss. Uh, but maybe oil hasn't gone down anymore. Maybe it's at 20 today roughly and say it's at 20 in 30 days from now when we'll need to roll again. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to constantly be buying at 26 and selling at 20. You're going to be losing, what is that, 30, uh, roughly 30%. And if you do this again and again, you can see why USO has a chart like it does. It's not just because oil's gone down, but it's because of what's called the negative, the negative carry. And you can see this has just been a completely, completely brutal chart, even though looking over, over multi years. Uh, these things almost always go down because of the negative carry, because Every time you roll, you are losing some. Uh, you are basically you're basically buying high and selling low, which is the opposite, of course, of what Warren Buffett tells us to do. But this is the problem with trading commodity ETFs, where the underlying commodity is in contango. There's constant negative carry, and so what you need is you would basically need oil to really spike up in order to make money on this. And if it doesn't move up quickly, you're going to be bleeding 10, 20, 30 percent every month. You can see that the crude oil market is already. So right now we're just call it twenty dollars a barrel. Everyone is saying, well, oil's got to move higher. Uh, but that's already priced into the futures curve. The December futures are already close to thirty four. So the market is pricing in an oil increase. Meanwhile, the, the actual energy data uh, is looking quite, quite negative. And some of these futures exchanges are actually preparing for negative prices. These futures can go negative. In other words, there could be so much crude oil that they're actually, they actually pay you to hold crude oil. Right? Normally you have to pay to store something, but they might actually pay you to do it. So these things, not only can they go to zero, they can go negative now. And this is, this is possible in a, in a depression or in a deflationary time as we are now. So that's another problem. But even in good times when there's oil demand, when people are actually not just stuck in their homes, when they're actually uh, going to gas stations and filling up their cars, and the trucks are shipping goods and the economy's open, you still have this negative carry problem. As a result, uh, especially if you're in a leveraged uh, ETF, this is an ETN it's very similar to an ETF. It has a different legal structure, but here's one that the lovely folks at Credit Suisse put out and the poor people who bought this, it basically went to zero or less than zero. This was a triple oil ETF. So if you combine a commodity ETF a, or, or, or ETN uh, like oil and you have a leveraged version of it, it really, you're, you're basically, you're getting, um, you're getting uh, a multiple of the negative carry. So if it's bad enough to lose uh, 10 or 20 percent a month or 30 percent on, on the on the roll, imagine if you lever that up 3x. So you're, instead of losing 10, 20 or 30 percent, you're losing 30, uh, 60 or 90 percent on the roll. It's just absolutely it's absolutely outrageous that these things are being sold. And so that's one reason I'm making this video. If you want to hold one of these for just one day, you can do that. On the other hand, these things have a history of going to zero. Uh, so one has to be has to be very very careful. This goes as well for the natural gas uh, ETFs, UNG, uh, which is the sort of the unlevered version, UGAS, UGAZ, which is 3x leverage, uh, DGAS, which is uh, 
3x inverse leverage, so you're betting that it's going to go down. Uh, they're, they're just a bunch of these, and these companies make a lot of money through the, uh, through the management fees, through the annual expense fees. Um, and so that's that's their incentive. But these natural gas, just like the oil ETFs and ETNs, has a similar uh, a similar problem. Uh, if we look at a chart, you can see this has just gone down over time. This is due to the um, you can see it's gone down quite sharply over time. These have a tendency to uh, to decay as well because of negative carry. And this makes sense if we look at what they're holding. Uh, so UNG, which is the the unlevered version. They are current. They hold the two front months roughly. Uh, they own the May natural gas futures and the June natural gas futures. So again, when you're buying this, you're not buying something physical. You're buying a derivatives. You're buying a basket of derivatives contracts, a basket of, of futures contracts. And if we look at the, um, this is the natural gas futures, which is what is held in UNG. If we look at their prices, it's very similar to crude oil in that you can see that we have May, June, July. And as we move out in time, especially um, especially uh, going into the, the winter months where they sort of spike, but even right now, you can see that every month is priced higher. So this is pricing in a recovery in natural gas prices. But what happens if natural gas prices stay level or only go up a little bit or go down, you still have the same negative carry you are rolling down, you're buying futures high, and then you're selling them low. And then you're buying them high, and you're selling them low. And so what this ETF does is it tries to stay in the two front months, but it's constantly rolling. And when the futures curve is in contango, it loses it loses money. Uh, I can't do this math in my head, but you're bleeding, you're bleeding a lot of money every, you're, it's about, what is this, 15 cents? On, so you're bleeding about 10%, uh, a little less than 10% uh, per month. Now, if you lever it up, like some of these levered ones, again, you're bleeding, instead of bleeding, call it 10% a month, you're bleeding 30% a month. So again, very toxic, toxic product. And this kind of advertising, invest in what's real. Uh, this is how they sell it, because in times of uncertainty, people want physical commodities. They want to feel like they're buying something real instead of pieces of paper. But there's nothing real about this. Uh, it is tied to reality, but if you if you know a lot about natural gas or oil prices, you will trade the futures. If you don't know a lot about them, you'll probably buy this and you'll get hurt by the contango or just get hurt by falling energy prices. Now, there is one uh, commodity ETF that is okay. It still has some problems, uh, but it's another popular one people always ask me about, so I thought I'd include it. This is the, the, uh, the gold ETF, the famous one, GLD. Now, this does not invest in the future, so it doesn't have the same contango problems. They still own gold, and they have to store it, and so, uh, but they do charge a management fee, which I think helps to cover this. So, what this is, if you're interested in buying gold because you want to hedge against inflation or hedge against the Fed printing a lot of new U.S. dollars, and you want a, a good store of value. You can buy this, but you, what you have to understand is that you are not buying gold itself. You are buying shares in a trust. And I'll, I'll link to this article from Forbes here. Uh, GLD represents fractional undivided interest in the trust. Uh, you're basically buying shares of the trustee and you're a shareholder of the trust, not a gold holder. And so if you're really worried about things uh, sort of going Mad Max or going going uh, crazy and economic breakdowns, you don't want to own something that trades like a stock. You don't want to own a piece of paper that is that may or may not be backed by physical gold. And there have been some uh, issues where people say the custodians of this fund or the sub-custodians, they don't, if times get really rough, they may not have the gold and they're not really required to have it. It's a fairly complicated thing. Uh, but I think if you are a gold bug or want to become a gold bug, the way to, um, you'll want to own physical gold, gold coins you can put in your pocket, gold bars if you have a lot of money, uh, but that would give you the actual physical underlying gold rather than a gold IOU. So I'll link to this article that has a couple more uh, critiques of GLD. GLD doesn't have the same future, the same problem as some of these commodity ETFs that we've talked about. It's not levered, so it's not the worst thing in the world. But if you're expecting an end of the world, if you actually want to have some physical gold, 
know that this thing could blow up if things get uh, bad. This is just a structure that was created on Wall Street. Uh, it's just a piece of paper, or it's it's actually just O's and, and uh, zeros and ones on your computer. And so the gold, if you really need it, it may or may not be there. So if I were, I'm not a gold bug. I think gold will do very well over the coming decade. I prefer to hold Bitcoin, which is a whole nother, uh, a whole nother subject. You can look um, my other videos on YouTube if you're interested in that. I think that is actually the best way to own um, a commodity as a store of value that has real scarcity. If you do want to get exposure to gold or oil, you'll want to check out the futures. Now, futures trading is risky. It's not for it's not for everyone, and you have to be very careful. But there are ways of trading futures without using a lot of leverage. You can, for example, put up the complete notional value of the futures account. So if you want to trade gold or oil, uh, the futures are the way to do it, not these, these uh, commodity ETFs. Unless, of course, you're just going to be holding them for a single day. If you're holding them for a single day, the commodity ETFs are okay. But if you want to learn how to trade futures, uh, one way to learn, you can check out my courses at Trader University Premium. And I've got just a ton of lectures on how futures work and how to trade them safely, including things like the crack spread, the crush spread, uh, basically everything you need to know to become a futures trader. Now, when you join Trader University Premium, you don't only get access to this futures course, you get access to all of my courses on there. Learn to trade stocks like a pro, learn to trade options like a pro, swing trading with options, uh, if you're interested in Bitcoin and crypto, you can follow my crypto investments where I actually let you see inside of my uh, one of my crypto accounts, as well as bear market trading strategies, which has a lot of great strategies that will work in the current bear market that we're in. So if this is something that interests you, if you have a lot of free time right now, you're at home because of quarantine, uh, this is a great, great way to use your time and really learn how the markets, the futures markets, the option markets, and the stock market actually work. Uh, rather than uh, just sort of trading and not knowing what you're doing because the markets are a difficult place and if you don't know what you're doing uh, you're gonna lose money and these these leverage ETFs and commodity ETFs are a very good example of of why you need to uh, really know what you're buying and what is contained in the underlying so if these courses look like something that would interest you uh, you can just click on the description notes below it'll take you to this page you can click on any of these courses to see the underlying curriculum, all the underlying lectures. And then you can click right down here where it says get it now. Now normally tuition, uh, 30 days access tuition is just $125 and that gets you access to all 12, 13 courses. But because we're in a recession right now, I wanted to give you guys a coupon code. And so if you click here where it says have a coupon code and type in YT as in YouTube 99, click update. That would take $26 off, so it would just be $99 for 30 days access. You can watch all the courses and then cancel before it renews. You won't be charged again, no long-term contracts or anything like that. So if you enjoy the way I teach, if you found this video helpful, uh, this is one way to really go much deeper into some of these subjects at a much deeper level than I can do in a YouTube video. Please hit that subscribe and like button if you haven't done so already and you found this video helpful. Let me know your questions, comments in the comment section below, and especially let me know what you would like me to make my next YouTube video about, what, what topics you'd like me to cover. Hope you're all staying well. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.